In the coming months, John Ajoy will become the longest serving president in the history of Georgetown University. He spent virtually his entire adult life on the hilltop, and under his leadership, Georgetown has launched two major fundraising campaigns, expanded campus facilities dramatically, and adapted academics to the new millennium. But President Ajoya doesn't do many interviews, and the Hoya was very, very pleased to finally sit down with him on March 4th after over half a year of trying. No questions were screened, no topics were off limits. We had accumulated questions from a year's worth of headlines, and President Ajoya was game to answer them. President Joya, you have a, a bachelor's degree from Georgetown, a PhD from Georgetown, and now you're on the verge of becoming the longest serving president in school history. What's the most important thing you've learned in these last 13 years on the job? Oh, that's a great question, Danny. The most important thing that I've learned is that we are always capable of doing more as a community than we can as a group of isolated individuals. This is a place that I think over time we've been able to achieve far more than we ever could have imagined as a result of the way in which all of us contribute to the life, the work, the mission of this place. I wanted to ask you about the, the 2010 campus plan because it's kind of been an underlying factor in a lot of uh, news events this year. There's that very memorable photo of the, the three-way handshake with you, Mayor Gray, and the neighborhood leader, Ron Lewis, when the agreement was reached in the summer of 2012. But in seeing the aftermath in so many areas of campus life, is there any denying that students were on the losing end of that bargain? Well, I, I, would, I would never characterize it that way at all. I think the, the ability we had to bring closure to that plan, first time we were able to do that in, in, in many years, without litigation, without long drawn out contention with the neighborhood, we, we actually have, I think, the most positive working relationship we have had during my years at the university even going all the way back to my student years, if we think about roughly the last four decades, the relations that we have with this, with this neighborhood and our ability to have a clear sense of what we can do in order to be able to continue to deepen and provide for our student experience has never been better than what we have now. The agreements that we made in that plan are absolutely consistent with our long-term vision for what we're trying to achieve as a university. We, we are able now to move forward and, and, and continue our efforts to expand on-campus residential capacity with the new um, north, north, Northwest Triangle and the renovation of the old Jesuit residence. And to first, it'll be a, a, a residence hall with the expectation that over time, as we're able to address further construction opportunities, we'll be able to turn that into an academic space. But honestly, the, the, the framework that we were able to establish and that was so memorialized in that photograph has provided a framework that enables us to strengthen the student experience and have a clear framework for growth for the university. You mentioned, you mentioned housing, and maybe the biggest story on campus this year was the possibility that an undergraduate dormitory would be acquired several miles off campus. And as you know, there was overwhelming disapproval from students and recent alumni when they heard that news. Well, well, you know, that, that plan has been scrapped for now, but what, what was your thought on a satellite residence? Well, we've had them before. Um, m during my undergraduate years, we had one right on Massachusetts Avenue, Alban Towers, it was called. We had about between eight, 800 and 900 students living there. Never ideal. And when we had the opportunity to build more on-campus housing and to, and to sell Alban Towers, we did so. So it's never an ideal option to have an off-campus facility. We were looking at a range of options. That was one of them. Our preference was always to find on-campus possibilities. And we needed to do the work to be able to determine, could we fit a residence hall next to Rice? Could we renovate the Jesuit residence, the old Jesuit residence? Pieces of that puzzle weren't clear. We were looking at a wide range of, of opportunities. I think that got a little bit out ahead of with the actual decision making. But was. even though you said that, that neighborhood relations seem to be moving in the right direction, when you think about the, just the fact that a satellite residence was on the table, you think about the parking restriction, the new dormitory, the clear and convincing standard off campus, it gives students the feeling that, that you know, now and in the foreseeable future, you know, students are the underdog in town gown relations. Well, I understand why students would feel that way. But I'd also say that it does require a bit of historical perspective to look at what we've been able to achieve over the course of roughly 30 years. 
and what we hope we're going to be able to achieve with this agreement. So if we go back, and again, since you, since you began by introducing me with my history, when I came as a first year student, we had 1,800 on campus beds. Today we have 5,000. That came as a result of successive master plans which recognized our highest priority was to make this a residential community. That was the goal. When I arrived, half the student body came from two states on the East Coast, New York and New Jersey. Today, California will be our, our, our largest state for students. Truly national student body, a, a strategy that began here at the university in the late 1960s. We were able to achieve that by the mid-1980s, but the expectation of students who came from roughly the mid-80s on, this would be a residential campus. So we had to build, we had to build dormitories, residence halls. We began doing that in 75, 76 with Henley Village. We went with Village, Village A, Village, Village C, Alumni Square. Eventually, we got to a point where our need to, to ensure continued development of the residential community required. We built a, a new academic building, the Intercultural Center, the Yates Field House, the Levy Center, and we kept on that, on that uh, trajectory to continue to deepen and develop this as a residential community. In the last campus, well, in the 1990 campus plan, the prerequisite for us to do any further academic development required more on-campus housing. It took us until 2000 to begin the Southwest Quadrangle Project. Once we did that, it freed up the possibility for us to then do the Royden B. Davis Performing Arts Center, the Hariri Academic um, right. Business School building in the, in the Regents Hall, and our next project will be the Intercollegiate Athletic Center. All those are contingent upon us having a sufficient residential character. And so what we committed to in this most recent plan was essentially part of a 40-year effort along, along that trajectory. And that's what we're trying to do with these new additions. We think 450 beds is going to be welcomed by our, by our community. We'll be close to 90% on campus. We've never had trouble filling our on-campus beds. Yeah. So we think it's all part of a, a, a pretty strong narrative that goes back almost 40 years. Although you do have a, you know, three decades of memory of, of life on the hilltop, you've also been a very forward-thinking president. And in November, you unveiled your Defining the Future of Higher Education initiative. At that time, you identified that higher education is at a critical turning point, yes. but you also said that it, it may have lost its way recently, including perhaps at Georgetown. What did you mean by that? Well, it's a great question. What, what I, I've been engaged in a number of conversations nationally where I've, I've been invited to offer perspective. And the key point that I was trying to address in the November talk was, was this question, in the face of unprecedented challenges in our, in our lifetimes, unprecedented challenges to the traditional model for higher education. How do, we, how do we understand those challenges as potential opportunities? And the way that I framed it was, what is it that we have to protect and then build? And what is it that we need to engage of these new, of these new potential opportunities? In terms of protection, there are three elements of the university that after the most careful reflection, and I look back on a, a life in this, I think must be understood and respected and protected are the formation of our students, the inquiry of our faculty, and the commitment of the university to contribute to the common good. And when I think about the university, I think those three elements are inextricably linked, mutually reinforcing, cannot be separated. And I believe one of the mistakes that's being made right now as you think about the future of higher education is the idea that you might be able to isolate pieces of this from the other elements. I believe we, we will lose the core of what we are if we believe that we can separate out pieces of this. In other words, that research that typically has taken place in universities can somehow be moved out and put in some other kind of context. Right. That, the, that we can never forget that the kind of research that takes place here is inextricably linked with the formation of young people. The faculty that we place in the classroom with you are, are the leading thinkers in their fields. They've tried to master a piece of our reality in a way that no one else in, their, in, in, our, in our world right. has tried to grasp the way that they do. And that you're in a classroom with them and that you have the opportunity to, to inter, in, interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis, that's, that is just, that doesn't happen anywhere else. 
Formation can occur in lots of different contexts. But the kind of formation that occurs in a university context, shaped by the sharing and the, and the construction of knowledge, that's only happened in these kinds of places. And we need to protect that with everything we've got. I'm glad you mentioned the essential role of faculty because there's a major national trend that's also seen at Georgetown uh, that's there's an increased role of adjunct faculty and a lot has been said about unionization and the fact that adjuncts tend to be underpaid but setting that aside do you think it's concerning concerning that more and more adjuncts are taking the place of tenured professors in classrooms yeah it's a very complex question in the in the roots of, of, of why that's the case are are require very careful attention. And let me just try to map out a little bit of it in our conversation. So we, ru we have roughly 500 plus or minus full-time tenure track faculty. That's a number that's been pretty stable here for, for a considerable period of time. Again, when I was an undergraduate, we had roughly 300. Over the course of the 1980s, early 90s, we grew that number to over 500. And that's about where we've been stable. We, ha we haven't um, increased that number. We have increased the number of full-time non-tenure track faculty. Mm -hmm. And we've also increased the number of adjunct during, during that period. And again, it, partly it's, it's to help fill some of, the, the, um, some of the openings that occur in any given moment. So a typical adjunct at Georgetown will likely be engaged at a point where we have an opportunity with them a member of our faculty has the opportunity to engage in a particular kind of uh, research project or extra, extra uh, university initiative, which is really valuable. And we need to be able to fill, fill that teaching responsibility for a, a brief period of time. And we sometimes will bring adjuncts in for that purpose. Over time, the bigger growth that we've had has been in the non-tenured, full-time faculty where at the departmental level, they've identified some outstanding faculty who are just terrific in the classroom and have been able to embrace our mission and the curriculum that we offer across our institution and can contribute in very meaningful ways. And then there's one other piece here, and that is in some of our schools, School of Foreign Service School, of Business School, of Law, some of the adjuncts are some of the greatest practitioners of our time. And we're able to bring them in because we have this extraordinary location here and that they want to be a part of what we're trying to do. So it, it is complicated because we, we have a, a extraordinary faculty that sometimes has opportunities we need to address. We have a very significant curriculum that we need to be able to deliver year in, year out, recognizing that sometimes we have a bit of flexibility with our, with our, our tenure track faculty or tenured faculty. And then we have that opportunity always to build on the experience of the great practitioners here in Washington. I preface that question by saying that I, d I didn't want the focus to be on, on salary, but is, is cost cutting a factor that goes into the rise of adjuncts? No, you know, our, our overall faculty size, with the exception of the sciences, is about commensurate with our peer group. So we, we compare two things always with a, with a cluster of schools that would be of no surprise to you. One is how well are we compensating our tenured track and tenured faculty, and how big is our faculty? Is it, is it commensurate in size with our peer group? And but for the sciences, where we recognize that we, we have not the size of a faculty commensurate with our peers, overall we feel pretty, pretty good about the overall size of our faculty. So the, 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 the non-tenured track and the adjunct faculty are generally helping us cope with the demands of a particular moment and not with the sort of core structure of what we're trying to do. When you were speaking of your initiative for the future of higher education, I thought of a book that I've heard that you read, which is Louis Manon's The Marketplace of Ideas, sure. where he talks about sure. university core curriculum. I had Luke right here in this room for, okay. a, for a meeting with senior colleagues some years back, about the time when he came out with that book. It makes me think also of, it seems like there's a growing emphasis among students on the pre-professional aspects of a Georgetown education. Do you think any reform is needed to counter that career-oriented focus to academics? Well, I, you know, it's interesting because on the one hand, we fully recognize that the, both the interests and, and the needs of our students to enter an, a, an ever more complex workforce require that 
there, there are some core skills that it would be great if we could ensure they pick up while they're here. The question we're wrestling with right now, does that have to happen in our traditional curriculum? Might we be able to offer, for example, non-credit or one credit or immersion experiences? So next week, spring break. What if you were to stay for the week and immerse yourselves in accounting for the non-financial major? Earlier this, this year, we offered an accounting course for our first year law students. We thought we'd get a modest number sign up because it was a two week commitment in August before the start of the school year. We, we probably had a 50% overrun in the terms of number of people who, who wanted, to, wanted to take that course. So we're, we're, we're paying attention to this. There are certain kinds of things. We, we, we've been listening to some employers here in the greater Washington area. How well are we preparing you to code? Well, if, unless you're taking certain kinds of courses in computer science, you're not going to pick that up here. Could we offer boot camps or immersion programs, summer institutes, break, programs during breaks where you might get exposure to certain kinds of skills that would be useful to you in the workplace? You know, we, we, I, I joke that we offered the, the minor in the college and business just to bring peace to the Thanksgiving dinner table so that anybody going home with an English major or a theology major or a philosophy major would be able to say to their folks, but I got this covered, you guys. I got this covered. The idea that we've got to find the right balance, I think, is very important in the lived reality of our students. And we're trying to find just the right, that, that right balance now. What do you think it says about Georgetown that the plurality of graduates enter consulting and investment banking? Well, it's, the first, it's usually the first job. And that's primarily because th those firms have a very um, well-developed onboarding for 22-year-old talent. And so the, the financial services, the consulting firms, I mean, our number one employer at commencement right now is Teach for America. And number two has been Deloitte Consulting here in Washington. And remember, that didn't exist a few years ago. So there are a number of consulting firms, financial services firms, that are brilliant at being able to engage talent at 22 and work with them for a few years. But rarely do our students stay on that trajectory. Often they're then going on to another degree or trying something else, going to work for somebody they may have consulted with or for. It's, it's a complicated you know, sort of set of realities, but I think it's not a surprise that a first job might be with one of those folks because they've, they've created a framework which makes it very accessible and very, very, very easy, essentially, to engage in that work. But we have students doing lots of other things, sure. as, as you know. Mm -hmm. The cost of attending Georgetown has more than doubled since you took office. Um, and for all that Georgetown has accomplished with need blind admissions and the ability to meet scholarship demand, do you fear that the barriers are only getting higher for students to study on the hilltop? Well, it's, it's never more, been more challenging for us to be able to ensure that anybody who wants to study here can study here. I mean, going back over the course of 35 years since we put in place the plan, in 1978, cost us $2 million. This year it will cost us $107 million to meet the cost of our full, our full need financial aid policy. We've sustained the policy. It still sends a signal to students anywhere in the country that this is a place that is realistic and affordable. But it's never been more challenging, equally challenging for the university to be able to sustain that commitment. Right. You've spent a lot of time trying to build the endowment and fundraise, and there's definitely an urgent need for that at this campus. Um, and the Public Policy Institute received a historic donation last, last fall that's no doubt uh, the, that money will be well spent. But when you think about people like Edward Bunn and Francis Healy and Joseph Lowinger who are immortalized around this campus, do you think someone like Frank McCord, who has faced serious criticism for the way he accumulated his fortune, belongs in that company? Um, Frank McCord is a three-generation legacy family at Georgetown. Um, his contribution came from a lifelong, a life, a life of hard work and engagement. He felt it appropriate to give back to the university at this time in his life, and I think he's, he honors the university and that is by the choice. You're familiar with the, the allegations that have been directed at him as far as giving an executive $400,000 for a charity run by the Dodgers driving the Dodgers. I recognize that there was a, I, serious I recognize that there were lots of criticism, public criticism of Mr. McCourt, but none of that in any way should result in a criticism 
of his generosity to support the mission of this university. Sure. You were very, uh, you had a prominent role in Big East realignment, and I spoke with Charles Deacon, the Dean of Admissions, last fall, and we talked about the role that our athletic programs and their prominence plays on just general visibility, and he said that, quote, from an institutional basis, the only negative of that uh, realignment is that we are probably taking a step backward in the national spotlight. So for as important as basketball is for growing our national reputation, is there any concern that the new arrangement could diminish that? The only way it'll be a step backward is if the Big East does not play basketball at the highest possible level. And this season is a good indication of the fact that this is a group of schools that will be able to play basketball at the highest possible level. So we, we could just give it a little bit of time. Yes. As Coach Thompson has said, that you, you've got to admit that it's, it's a step backward from, from the, the arrangement that it once was. It's right? 16 schools, 11 of which were among the very best in college basketball. We're now with 10 schools, some of which are the very best in college basketball. We're going to make it work in the best way we can. Georgetown's athletic programs are generally stay above the fray of some of the NCAA misconduct we hear about. But when women's basketball head coach Keith Brown was fired um, last fall for serious verbal abuse of players, we at the Hoya were very troubled that the athletic director, Lee Reed, wasn't available for comment. Uh, do you believe Mr. Reed should have made himself accountable in the face of that scandal? Well, again, when, whenever you're engaged in a, a serious um, personnel action, you are constrained in what you can talk about. And I'm sure at the time, uh, Athletic Director Reed felt that the public statement that the university made was what we were capable of making in the face of, of, of the dynamics at stake. In your inaugural address in 2001, you identified the tension between Catholic val the, the attention that can occur between Catholic values and the general practices of the academy. Uh, during your time as president, what's been the most challenging instance of navigating that tension? Ooh, that's a great question. You know, I suppose um, the most the most public and without doubt a somewhat significant challenge was was dealing with the implications of the Affordable Care Act. And what was kind of the guiding value that led you to your eventual decision with that? Well, we are a Catholic and Jesuit university and we wanted to ensure that we had fidelity to the deepest values that have animated this university for 225 years. And we were also then confronted with the dynamics of responding appropriately as an American institution to the implications of the Affordable Care Act. So getting that balance right was an important one for us. Right. I promise not to get, a, get carried away with hypotheticals, but if you'll indulge me in one. If you were in the position to choose your successor, and, af <laughs> and after reviewing all of the candidates, the most qualified person happened to be gay, would he or she get the job? I, I can't imagine that our board of directors would discriminate for any can on any candidate, regardless of the criteria. So that's a yes? I, Potentially? I, absolutely. You've spent virtually your entire adult life on the hilltop, and when the time comes that you do decide to step down, do you have any thoughts? I'm a pretty young guy, so I, Definitely. No, this you have, line no. of questioning has me a little bit. No, I'm with you. You're, you've set the record, and there's a lot of uh, you know, positive stuff in sight. but. When that time comes, do you have any thoughts about what your next move might be? No, at this point, I'm so immersed in what I'm doing here. And I have a 12-year-old son who's in the seventh grade, and we're looking forward to high school in a year. Everything that I, I am, everything that I do is immersed right now here at Georgetown and with my family. When, when it's time and, and I step down, and yeah. we'll, we'll, come to, anything, we'll come to that. Anything in the immediate future that, that excites you about what's going to take place at Georgetown? Oh my gosh. I mean, this is the most exciting time in my, my 30, 39 years. Since the day I arrived as a freshman, I've had the privilege to be a part of so many extraordinarily exciting things. But right now, given the challenges higher education faces and the opportunities that we're engaging, this, this is the very best time. And I can't, can't wait to see what unfolds this spring and the work of our faculty on the Futures Project. I can't wait to see how our efforts in engaging with technology and, and the ITEL initiative and how that unfolds. The new construction projects that we'll be launching are, are going to even more enhance the quality of the student experience. There, th this is the best moment, and I can't wait to see what unfolds. Me too. All right, well, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Great, great to be with you. I appreciate you. it. Thank you.